it is my pleasure to introduce to you our chairman of the National Hemp Association, Jeff Whaling. Um, sorry for a little bit of departure from the regular schedule. Um, thank you for being here. I'm Jeff Whaling. I'm going to ask our um, guests to, to join us. Um, you know, we're at a crossroads with our industry uh, today, um, in part because of these two gentlemen. Um, so Greg Eibach is the Undersecretary for Ag and Markets and Regulatory Programs for USDA. Um, Greg has been so helpful to our industry over just the most recent months. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of challenges in bringing seed in from around the world so we can start to build this industry. It would not have been possible without the help from, from Greg um, and his team within USDA. Um, Axel Bernabe is uh, the chief counsel to Governor Cuomo. He is responsible for health, um, and under that, uh, he is responsible for the state's uh, cannabis program, uh, and a focus of that is the hemp and CBD industry. Um, both of them um, have come here really to listen to all of you. Um, so although I would like them to introduce themselves and tell us how they got um, to where they are today, um, I'd like to go into some specific issues that I've learned from the industry that are very important uh, as we move forward and as the regulations on a federal level are, are developed. Um, and then we'll get into you know, taking your questions because both of these gentlemen want to use this as a listening session so that they know what the industry is concerned with and we can address some of those most important issues like the uh, legal um, uh, offering that came out of USDA's general counsel this week that really should open and clarify some of the issues. So with that, let me uh, ask Greg to introduce himself and share kind of how he got here, not only from his career path, but maybe can share with us some of his hobbies. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, Prior to uh, coming to uh, USDA as the Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs, I served as Nebraska's uh, Director of Agriculture uh, for about uh, 13 years. Uh, I, my wife and I have a farm in central Nebraska. Uh, we're, uh, we're, it's more, we're more ranchers than farmers, actually. We have a cow-calf operation, and, uh, but we also grow row crops. And so uh, I, the reason why I came to the Department of Ag in the first place is because of my involvement in the agricultural industry in Nebraska. And so I still uh, feel very much uh, the farmer at heart. Uh, we have a son home on the, on the ranch now, running it on a day-to-day -day basis. We have another son that uh, lives in Minneapolis with his wife and uh, works in the grain trade industry. And we have a daughter that is in Colorado that uh, uh, is a lobbyist uh, for Farm Bureau in Colorado. So very agriculturally oriented our, farm, our family is. Uh, USDA uh, is uh, charged with the task of developing, working with farmers and ranchers as we develop the protocols uh, for what the legislation that was passed in the Farm Bill provides for uh, growing hemp. And for the most part, uh, we're gonna be looking at providing guidelines through our regulations on you know, establishing how we can know where hemp is being grown, what type of testing protocols are appropriate. Uh, if uh, it doesn't meet the threshold of 0.3 THC, how we will take care of destroying that in the field and then putting together and working with states to have compliance programs in place. And for the most part, we think most states uh, that are going to allow hemp to be grown are going to have their own plans. Uh, but if they don't, we will have a, uh, a method whereby uh, agricultural producers could apply to the USDA uh, to be able to get their license to, to grow hemp. Uh, with that, I maybe would just you know sure. stop here and look forward to your questions. Great. Um, Axel, why don't you? Uh, so thank you very much for having us, uh, and it's nice to be here with everyone today. Uh, my background is less in agriculture. Um, uh, I'm health He's focused. A Canadian. <laughs> That's right. I'm originally Canadian. <laughs> so am I. No, and uh, uh, but I'm an attorney by training. Antitrust was what I practice in healthcare. So this has been an interesting journey in terms of setting up markets and understanding demand for products. 
But um, my, my role, as Jeff pointed out, is to assist the governor in standing up uh, various cannabis-related programs. So we have a medical program that we rolled out in 2014, and then a, uh, a hemp program that we uh, rolled out in 2015, uh, and a proposal for adult use. And we, um, we're trying uh, very hard uh, to, to find frameworks that work for regulating a plant that has been uh, pushed underground for so many years. Um, and on the CBD front, we, we've been very big proponents here in New York of hemp. Uh, we've been working to try to expand the industry and we've grown the program significantly over the last few years and we realized pretty quickly that it was an agricultural crop as Greg pointed out but it also starts to uh, develop into dietary supplements into uh, food additives uh, into food itself and so we've been we've been looking to the federal government to the extent that, that, that they've been stepping into the space for guidance on how to treat some of this but we understand that it's, it's a big problem uh, for everybody, and so we wanna, we wanna be an interim gap, a, a middle, uh, you know, a solution for the, for the, during, the during the time that, that there may be a gap in regulation at the federal level, and so we've, you know, we've been working on that. So we, we go from agriculture a little further along the line to, uh, uh, to, to health and, and dietary supplements. But again, so many ways to skin this cat, as everybody here knows, so we're happy to take those questions and approach it from wherever is most helpful for everybody here. Yeah, so um, as you probably were uh, asked, there is the, the CWCB Expo app, um, and so your questions can come in to Erica and we will get them asked. But I'm gonna start the conversation uh, really kind of turning to, to Greg, and you know, everyone believes that the Farm Bill has given USDA the responsibility um, to develop all-encompassing regulations that will bring in eight, nine, ten agencies' uh, opinions as to how they're going to deal uh, with hemp. Um, that is a bit of a misconception, and maybe, Greg, you can say, I mean, we all know that the FDA is meeting today, um, and there is the thought that, you know, the FDA will be giving their guidance and regulatory authority to Greg's group to put into regulations. So, and uh, that is exactly, I think, uh, uh, different uh, federal agencies are still going to maintain their authorities, you know. EPA will regulate uh, herbicides and uh, fungicides that will be eligible to be used on, on hemp crops. Uh, FDA has that uh, food and drug responsibility to determine how they're going to regulate or identify what is, uh, whether or not the claims being made um, meet their expectations and uh, can be passed along to consumers. Uh, we still, we're, we're going to focus on the farming side of it and set the regulations to be able to produce hemp and uh, within the guidelines that the Farm Bill provided. And we still have other agencies that will have a role. The Justice Department with DEA will still have a role and uh, we will report some information to them as uh, required by the Farm Bill about locations of where the fields are so they know uh, and can share with law enforcement that when somebody drives by, they know that's a hemp field because it's registered uh, to be in that location. And uh, so, and then uh, Treasury will still have their responsibilities and we'll have to come up with some guidance for uh, uh, some banking and those concerns as well, but uh, ours we will we we have to work with those other organizations as we work to provide the program for farmers, but uh, they still will maintain their responsibility. So as that kind of moves forward, then we're into a situation where state by state, states are developing plans. USDA is not looking at plans right now because they don't have the regulations in place mandated by the Farm Bill. Um, and so it would be unfair for states to su submit their plans uh, because they have no nothing so to do. Maybe if it's okay, and sure. uh, uh, just where we're at on developing the regulations, uh, it's our intent that we're going to develop the regulations this summer and be able to present an interim final rule uh, this fall that would uh, be in time for states to make sure their plans uh, match up with our regulations. But I think for now, states could uh, take a look at the farm bill and see what's expected in the, what's required in the farm bill for a state plan to have, because it's gonna, we're gonna mirror that in our regulations. 
And so if the states are working with the 2018 Farm Bill or looking at that closely, they could probably start working on their regulations and then just be able to make tweaks when we come out with our regulations. We then will have uh, 60 days once our regulations become final to approve state plans. So we could have 43, 44, 45 different state plans hit our desks at USDA all at the same time. And uh, we will, uh, we have to approve or reject those plans within 60 days. We'll work with uh, states to try to make sure that if there's just minor uh, compliance issues, we'll work with them to help them get that done so we're just not mailing back rejected plans. And then uh, we hope to have those states capable of having farmers grow under the provisions of the 2018 Farm Bill in the 2020 growing season. Excellent. Um, and, you know, part of that, um, I think there is a general belief that although the process with the FDA starts today, um, it is going to be a long and lengthy process until they come out with some guidance on all things uh, related to hemp. And I know that most of the industry has been focusing on um, CBD. Um, we have had the great honor of um, being, I think, one of the only organizations to sit in front of the FDA to listen to them. But absolutely everything from this plant that is either going to be consumed by humans or consumed by animals that are fed to humans have an FDA process. Um, so CBD obviously is the leading issue uh, for the industry, but there's going to be years until even seed that is going to be fed to chickens uh, will be able to be researched and taken to the marketplace. And you know, on that, I think that New York State is looking on how they're going to deal with issues like CBD in the interim um, until such time as both federal regulations and guidance from FDA are out there. Maybe yeah, no, that's, speak to that. that's a good way of teeing it up. So, you know, just as a segue, we, we're very bullish on, on, the, on the fiber. Uh, you know, you saw the BMW outside. We'd like to uh, develop that side of the market. And so the guidance that, that Greg's talking about is going to be very helpful to just cement that uh, in hempcrete and, uh, and allow us to, to, to take care of one of the segments of the cannabis plant. So, so we're looking forward to that, and uh, we're very happy. What we, what we anticipate is that there's going to be a little bit more complication and difficulty when it comes to CBDs, CBD or other cannabinoids and extraction processes and whether they fit into food as additives or as dietary supplements. So there, I, what we're hoping is that uh, to the extent that the federal agencies, whichever one is responsible, decides that they're going to need more time to study it, that we won't be precluded from stepping in. So one of our biggest concerns is that right now the industry is moving forward and it needs some guidance and it needs some testing. So we've already, quietly I would say, uh, we already probably have one of the most stringent set of uh, uh, requirements for, for hemp producers and extractors in the country. We, we haven't issued regulations in that regard. What we've done is we've put it in our research partner agreements pursuant to the 2014 Farm Bill. But if you look at those research partner agreements, if you are one of our growers or processors, you'll know that when you process CBD or extract CBD from the hemp plant in the state of New York, you have to abide by CGMP standards. And, and that is a requirement. Um, and we want to, our proposal, our legislative proposal is to formalize that in law to create uh, legal categories of licenses that would that would have obligations in the way they do, uh, in the way they do their processing, in the way they test for contaminants, heavy metals, pesticides, uh, in the way they label their products. We'd like to make sure that there is, especially if you're looking at high cannabinoid content uh, products, that they have uh, suggested uses and that they have a full disclosure of the of the amount of cannabinoids that are that are in the product. So that's again outside. That's probably within the FDA's purview. But uh, we're hopeful that w w actually we're conflicted, and we don't know whether our plan should include a proposal like that uh, and uh, uh, and risk uh, bumping up against approval, or whether we should just focus on the on the low hanging fruit sort of December twentieth farm bill language, and then and then do our dietary supplement world uh, separately. So that that's that's one thing we're. Uh, hoping to read uh, a little bit into into the regulations or guidance that comes out of the USDA, but but that's that's it's a lot of work from a state perspective because we're not used to doing the FDA's job 
uh, and hopefully we don't have to do it for very long, but in the interim, we, 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 we want to step up. Great. Uh, and so that's why these listening uh, tours and discussions have been going on. USDA uh, hosted one um, at uh, the beginning of March. Um, there were thousands of people from around the country that participated in 4, it. 4,000. Uh, 4,000. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was texting some of the, st the staff who were, um, you know, participating in that within USDA, and they were like, this is fascinating. You know, we just don't know what we don't know. And I think all of us will admit this. There are going to be twists and turns to this. Um, and so patience is really going to be important because, and we have to remember, we are reintroducing a crop that has been absent our farmlands for 85 years, and it's not just a crop for rope anymore. It's all of these potentials that, you know, are soon to become household words. People are seeing CBD at corner stores. They have no idea what this is all about. So part of that listening session is questions, and I think Erica might have some. Yes, we do have a few. Okay, so the first question is, are there any official analytical methodologies to test the amount of THC in the plants? Yes, uh, many states already have uh, uh, testing protocols that they've been using as they were uh, uh, had plans under the 2014 Farm Bill. And so uh, we're uh, part of what we're doing at USDA right now is looking at those different uh, 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 protocols that states have established to, to try to understand uh, what regimes that uh, we think are accurate and uh, would work uh, and will give probably a range of different uh, choices that states can incorporate into their plans to cover testing. Excellent. What do you, what do you guys think? I mean, we're, we're struggling with this question, and it's not only a question of you know, what part of the plant you test and at what time of the harvest you test it. It's also THC versus THCA. It's, um, it's, it's what happens after harvest, which I know is, again, outside the purview of the USDA, but but we are concerned about the concentration of THC uh, post extraction. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we're looking forward to a little bit of guidance on a threshold for if it's the top eight inches, if it's um, uh, you know, selective bits uh, and, and the timing, that would be, I think standardizing that across the country would be extremely helpful. Well, well, and, and one of the things that we, you know, we've been discussing is, you know, USDA is gonna be responsible for the, uh, the rules and regulations as it was uh, as it pertains to growing this crop and taking it to harvest. But after that, and what happens with that harvest and who might do what with that harvest uh, is still up for either the states or another jurisdiction, the federal government, to, uh, to weigh in on. So mm -hmm. these are just some of those twists. Yeah, I would just also um, say I would have a little bit of concern if, if states are allowed to choose from multiple protocols then if a hemp tested in one protocol is then transported to another state that uses a different protocol to make sure that they understand that they have to accept whatever that state chose to, to use as their given protocol. Because I think that some of the issues we're yeah. seeing now with genetics, like say from Oregon versus Colorado, um, that are they're tested different ways. Yeah, and I think that's something we also recognize is important. Excellent. Okay, um, our next question, um, is there a current USDA certification for hemp or hemp products? Uh, so right now, uh, the uh, USDA was not involved with the 2014 Farm Bill uh, rollout, and those were research pro authorized research projects where uh, um, People, uh, states develop their plans outside of any federal government oversight. And so the, what we will have when we uh, come out with our regulations later this fall will be the first time that we have any type of classification of what uh, constitutes uh, hemp. But we will adhere to the farm bills, the legislative language that established point three as a threshold that uh, hemp will need to be below 0.3 THC uh, and when tested prior to harvest. And just like Jeff had mentioned, uh, we will establish up to harvest that it uh, meets uh, the hemp classification, but after that then uh, there will be challenges for states to regulate uh, what might be done uh, with the hemp as far as concentrating it, uh, 
blending it with uh, true marijuana or uh, other, uh, other issues like that. Um, and on a kind of related note, so do you know, like, for the, for the companies that are claiming that they have USDA, USDA organic status right now, how they accomplished that? Uh, and no, I'm not sure about that. We would have, uh, you know, we would certify people's farms as far as uh, other uh, agricultural crops. Uh, I don't know that uh, third-party certifiers have been, uh, uh, they may have been certifying the production of hemp, uh, but. Yeah, so from, from our experience in working with USDA, you know, there was a time period where people were working under the pilot programs. Uh, they were submitting applications for USDA organic status, um, and they kind of squeaked through because USDA wasn't sure how they uh, should handle them. They did try to rescind some of those things, but it is one of the questions that we have is, since this crop has got seed from around the world, and we want to, those of us who are really interested in advancing it on an organic basis, how do you start that? Where do you get that organic seed from? Um, and I think it's one of the questions that we at the National Hemp Association have. You know, the seed that's out there right now, people want to claim it's organic because it has been grown using organic practices. But was that original seed organic? And no one really knows the answer to that yet. Another challenge. <laughs> yeah. so. All right, so the next question I think is a very good one. Um, certainly the 2018 Farm Bill does have a provision in it that you cannot have a felony drug offense within the, the past 10 years to be able to have a license. So the question from the audience is, will there, will, will there be fingerprinting requirements in order to um, determine about whether or not a license or is an affidavit for or just a background check going to be sufficient? So that's one of the things we're looking at, multiple state plans to see, uh, uh, kind of get an indication of what states have been comfortable with as far as those requirements for uh, the background check and whether or not that includes fingerprints. And we're weighing the different state plans as we develop our regulations. Okay. Um, and I just like on a personal note, I would like if there would be fingerprinting required that um, I would encourage that there be an exception for plain sect uh, Amish or Mennonite communities that are exempt from federal taxes that they would be exempt from the fingerprinting requirement as well. So as I've traveled across the country and appeared um, at Senate hearings um, and discussions about hemp, uh, this is an important issue. Uh, it's one of the things that we've started a discussion uh, with USDA on, and uh, one of the things that we're asking them to consider is that uh, this uh, felon ban only applies to uh, the permit holder, um, so that we would be able to get an entire group of people who should be able to work in this space, who might be subject to a, a felon ban to be able to continue to work in this space, but not be the legal responsible person um, to either the state or the federal government. That person has to abide by the felon ban. But again, these are one of the issues that we have to discuss because it's not really clarified in the federal uh, farm bill. Yeah, and we, for, for what it's worth, we would advocate that, you know, that, that it be as limited as possible. I, I think it's a bit of a, um, a leftover from, um, you know, a framework of criminalizing cannabis, which has been somewhat ineffective in managing this plant. And we, we prefer a public health approach which, uh, which doesn't emphasize uh, criminal background checks in our, in our proposal for adult use, which is not part of this conversation, but would be the most controversial uh, segment of the market. We, we don't want to exclude folks just because of prior convictions. And in fact, if they were incarcerated because of low-level marijuana offenses uh, and they were disproportionately impacted by, by a um, <coughs> Uh, somewhat ineffective policy. Um, we would like to, you know, to have them participate in the market. So hemp is even one, for, from our perspective, one step removed. The only reason you would want to have that kind of uh, uh, felon ban would be for diversion concerns. But considering, uh, just considering how much the cannabis conversation has evolved over the last 10 years, I think it's a bit of an anach anachronistic approach. But uh, and that's all kind of we'll say about Well, that. and in this particular case, I'm quite proud that Senator Grassley has my cell phone number because he can lay into me over this issue. It's something that he and I have discussed many times, but, um, you know, he thinks that 
we're still dealing with this old era of um, hemp being uh, and marijuana being kind of a gateway drug. And, you know, he just doesn't know what he doesn't know yet. But as more and more states, including his own, are getting on board and farmers are looking for this as just one more rotational crop to help them, um, I think that we just might be able to convince him, too, to come to the right side of this issue. Let's hope so. <laughs> Um, okay, so this, this might be more appropriate for you, Axel. Um, consumers are confused with various terminologies and their definitions, such as hemp oil, hemp seed oil, full spectrum hemp oil, broad spectrum hemp oil, et cetera. Are there going to be any official definitions that specify and clarify what these are? Hmm. In five standards. words or less. Yeah. <laughs> and that's an excellent question, by the way, whoever yeah. Yeah. submitted that. Well, we are... Uh, committed to trying to standardize the industry and facilitate consumer choice because we think it's not only good for consumers, it's good for the industry. Right now, folks that are, um, that are processing below standards, uh, that aren't labeling, that are not actually including in the product whatever it is they say on the labels included, are just doing the entire industry a disservice. And in an ASIN industry, the last thing you want is some adverse event related to some child ingesting too much CBD or somebody a contraindication with a dietary supplement and a blood uh, pressure medication and having someone drive off the road. So the, the so yes in a very broad uh, in a very broad sense. Absolutely. And I think we're willing to sort of lead the the nation on uh, on getting on rolling up our sleeves on that. The particular categories you identified are elusive even for uh, biochemists, I understand. So um, you know, is GW Pharma's Epidiolex drug, which has a single compound molecule as an efficacy trial under the FDA, but also contains a bunch of cannabinoids, is that full spectrum or is it a single molecule drug? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. You know, if you recombine cannabinoids after having separated them, uh, is that full spectrum or does full spectrum have to be a processing method which doesn't separate the cannabinoids and the terpenes in the, to begin yeah. with? So, so but, and I, and I'm not, you know, I'm just saying that it's, it's actually a, a good problem to have. There's so much opportunity. So yes. what, I guess on the other side of the spectrum, what we don't want to do is overly restrict by coming out and forcing categories onto folks. But definitely, mm -hmm. right, uh, hemp oil is a function of the Controlled Substances Act. Nobody wants to say CBD because they're afraid that they'll bump up against the, the, the DEA. We do want to start having clarity in labeling. So we do, if it's CBD, we want you to put CBD on there. Other minor cannabinoids, identify how much. So we're big on labeling. If you have suggestions on, on, on labeling proto prototypes, we don't, we haven't forced those out onto the industry until it's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more vibrant, but we are open to, to suggestions on that front. Excellent. Um, okay. Uh, how quick do you anticipate approval of CBD vaporizers in New York State? <laughs> On the first, the first chance he gets. Well, <laughs> get I mean, that passed. Well, but you know, it, it's again a, a difficult. We understand vapor is. A, we, we take a fairly pragmatic approach to this, and and that's we were, Greg and I were we're talking about this. We see vape products with CBD on the market now. We have them in our medical program, and a lot of people have them in their, in their adult use program. So they're out there. People are selling them now under the farm bill. So, so they're out there. So our perspective is take a, a harm reduction approach to this and facilitate a way to get the best possible products out there. So we are generally um, supportive but cautious. And uh, the speed with which we, we, we roll it out will depend on the speed with which the New York industry develops uh, a ver a, an integrated uh, distribution channel for them. So if we know where it's being grown and we know it's CGMP processed, and we know it's been tested according to the highest standards, and we know you're labeling it properly, then we can start talking about it being sold in New York. But un until we have that happening, then, then you know, you're importing CBD oil from China, and you're using a cartridge that we don't know anything about, and then you're slapping a, a label on it, we don't know where you've tested it, then we're not in a hurry to approve that product. So, so, so I, you know, I, I, that's, I know it's non-definitive non an answer, but but that's how we're approaching all of it, including beverages. Um, you yes. know, so. Sounds fair to me. Uh, will organic hemp and conventionally grown hemp be treated or differentiated in regulations? Uh, no, I don't see where that would uh, be required to, 
uh, regulate in the regular hemp regulations to separate that. Organic is a, uh, a growing protocol. It's separate, and so just like we, uh, you know, wouldn't necessarily you know corn's corn until it's uh, produced under the organic standards, and then it becomes organic corn. Excellent. Um, does New York State intend to mandate third-party testing and disclosure of hemp products, including cannabinoid content, to protect consumers from fraudulent product claims? Yes. The short answer, that's already required if you're a research partner with us uh, and you're a processor uh, or manufacturing a manufacturer of any cannabinoid product, you have an obligation because we've imported the federal dietary supplement law into, into our research partner agreement to develop a, a has, hazmat plan, have a third party certification for your standard operating procedures and confirm that you're, you're up to snuff on that. Um, we don't have labs right now that are doing that in the state of New York. We have a couple that are coming online, but so you can go out of state to do that. But eventually we're hoping that we'll have a, a lab industry here that'll take care of those needs as well. But yeah, the short answer Excellent. is absolutely. Uh, and just for, for you guys, before you arrived, um, we took a little bit of a poll of the audience and it seems that we have about a third of our audience are cultivators in some form, a third are processors and a third are retailers, just so you know what the dynamic of the audience is. Um, okay, with FDA rules and regulations, how is it anticipated that will relate to the beauty space? Um, member says, uh, I'm about to launch a CBD skincare line that will evolve into using other cannabinoids. Any advice or information on how to proceed, uh, how this pertains to the beauty space and how to not have bank accounts seized? For the answer to that question, you should be at FDA's hearing in Washington, D.C. today. <laughs> That's uh, definitely within FDA's purview of how they're going to move forward with, uh, with their regula uh, regulations and their determinations there. Maybe you guys can yeah, I mean, cosmetics, we're still at the dietary supplements and food uh, analysis. Uh, <laughs> cosmetics is... Um, I, I, I don't know, I would venture it's probably the safer area to be in because if the FDA does weigh in with a dose protocol, uh, cosmetics probably have a slightly lowered uh, amount of cannabinoid in it, so you're probably going to have, and nobody's ingesting it, so you're probably going to have a little bit of an easier time. Uh, but again, you know, we, we would look to explore uh, regulating that or providing guidance to folks that are, that are producing cosmetics in the state of New York. Uh, until such time as the FDA uh, enters the space and, and provides national regulation. We just, we haven't gotten there yet. Great, so uh, as certainly is seen here, um, we spend about 98% of our time at the National Hemp Association, and I'm sure these gentlemen, and Greg will slowly get, get with his group on the program, 98% of our time talking about 2% of the potential of this crop. Uh, so we spend a lot of time talking about CBD. One of the things that um, we, uh, thank you. Some water for that. Um, one of the things that you know we also need to look at is how do we really help advance this as a farm crop, and how do we help farmers? And then you know how are we taking that into a decortication facility? You know I remind that there is no equipment in this country that can commercially harvest industrial hemp. Obviously, there's some successful patented equipment that comes from Europe. There are decortication facilities in uh, Europe uh, and in China, um, but they're using 110-year-old technology in order to break this crop apart. Um, it is both a challenge, but also an opportunity for us in the United States. Uh, one of the things that we have done with USDA before starting to work with the Undersecretary's group um, and they really have helped guide us is working with NIFA, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and under the former director, Sonny uh, Raswamy, he really gave us some guidance as to how to start this process. Um, and one of the things was uh, trying to create these centers of excellence, um, working with universities and research who wanted to really uh, take on this crop and to advance it as quickly as possible. Because as the Undersecretary has said, there is an awful lot of interest in this crop. There are many states who are going to start to grow this crop far more uh, this year than ever before. 
Montana has permitting to grow more hemp this year than the entire country did last year. And the question I have for them is, what are they going to do with it? Because um, as a Canadian, I worked for the Canadian administration that introduced hemp some 28 years ago to our landscape. Lots of excitement, lots of public and private sector money went into it. Farmers thought this was going to be a huge opportunity for them. And then came, how do we harvest it? How do we take it apart? How do we really realize all of this potential for this crop? And one of the things that we really worked with under the 2014 Farm Bill, because there was no guidance that gave USDA the regulations, we kind of reminded them that what we all refer to as Section 7606 of the 2014 Farm Bill, its title was the legitimacy of industrial hemp research. So NIFA came to our rescue and then started to look at ways that they could start to fund research. Um, and they have been very helpful. They have asked us to consider the uh, centers of excellence. Now that hemp has been, on, on December 20th, removed from the controlled substances, every single university in this country that is interested in this crop no longer has to worry about their general counsel saying that hemp is a controlled substance, we're not going to touch it because it will jeopardize all of our other federal funding. That window has been lifted and now people are coming. And maybe, you know, we can talk about you know, the center of excellence that uh, the New York administration is supporting that we would like to see brought forward, but also maybe talk about the other opportunities for funding that will eventually come from USDA. Well, I think that uh, you bring up an important point. If you're uh, considering growing or going to be a grower next year, I think you should definitely be concerned about lining your production up with, with processing. Uh, maybe have a contract in place uh, that uh, with a, a reputable um, partner that uh, you trust will uh, pick up the hemp at the end of the growing season and pay you for it. Uh, there have been some anecdotal stories across the nation already about uh, problems where farmers have grown hemp, but they don't have a market for it at the end. So I think this is a, an important concern when we look at all the excitement there is uh, surrounding growing hemp, I think we have a real danger this summer of producing way more hemp than we have the ability to process. And what does that mean for those growers that you know, have invested a lot of money and time into growing a crop if they can't uh, convert it to cash? And, and this is one of the things that USDA um, is, uh, is very interested in. I just spoke at um, a conference that they had with the scientific division, um, and certainly they want to advance the science, but they also want to help advance the technology so that we can start to build this commercial industry. Right now, you know, we're kind of a cottage industry, um, and certainly with investments, as we all know, that, like uh, Canopy Growth has made into the United States, their commitment to build hemp industrial parks, that is the beginning. Uh, but we all need to move uh, slowly and steadily in order to ensure that we do not repeat what happened in Canada. Although they sell $600 million worth of seed and seed oil into the United States every year, um, that is the only thing that they're doing from a hemp crop uh, that is really kind of a commodity crop. Uh, so we need to be very careful as to you know, how we move forward. Certainly, now that tribal councils and territories um, are now legally allowed to start to grow hemp, there is a huge opportunity for them in the southern climates to grow one, two, and three crops a year. Um, and again, that only multiplies the problem. And so maybe you can talk yeah. about what New York has done from almost day, day one about investment. So just, uh, just to frame it here, you know, we were very interested in uh, hearing from industry about how they propose to kickstart the, the fiber and core uh, and decortication associated with that fiber and core industry. We've been, you know, most of our growers are fully feminized CBD uh, plant growers. And uh, quite frankly, we have a bit of a blind spot on the economic viability or profitability of a dual use crop for, you know, with, with sort of letting it seed in the, in, in the fields and, and collecting both seed, uh, fiber, and CBD. Uh, we don't know of too many people that are doing that. I think Canopy is one of the few that is, that is, uh, that is exploring that. So if anybody is working on a dual-use crop, 
please let us know. We, we'd love to hear how that's working out for you and how you plan on monetizing or selling the, the fiber and stock. We have SUNY uh, New York. We have a number of different research uh, entities that are looking at fiber. We have FIT looking at textiles. There are a lot of people that are interested in developing this. We just need the supply. The other uh, concern related to that is is cross-pollination. So that's not something we... You are reading our minds. Oh, I see. We, we, it's not something uh, at the state level that we traditionally would get involved in, and it's not something that we think we'd be the best positioned to manage. We are happy to uh, track where people are, uh, are farming and having that information made available to folks so that they know where to plant. But that is going to be an increasingly complicated issue. And so the more we start to gear up for a dual-use economy and really explore the opportunity associated with, with fiber, um, uh, we really need to think, and again, eliciting feedback, uh, not here necessarily, but in, in any form you, you, you may want to share it, on how to apportion that. Do we make the North Country or certain parts of uh, the Southern Tier on the West Side, do we make that more of a dual-use? What kind of buffer, buffer zones? Do we need? We know Cornell's planning on coming out with a report about uh, uh, cross pollination and, and what the distances look like. But that's a concern we've heard from a lot of farmers, especially mm -hmm. in the in the Hudson area. Um, and uh, so, again, so love you're to thinking hear back. more like um, awarding permits on a first come, first serve basis, just allowing them to have the information of who's growing what surrounding them. Or, I mean, like, if you don't know until the end of the application process who's growing what where, um, it kind of makes it difficult for... I don't know what the solution is to this problem, to be honest with you. I, I just seriously don't. I've just... Um, I, I don't think we do either. Because I, you know, I was just asked about, you know, like, if you regulate it, then, then yeah, how do you pick winners and losers? Um, it's, it is challenging. So, so there, there are some... Um, uh, commercial apps, uh, applications that uh, are, uh, I don't know, does New York uh, uh, register, I can't think uh, if it's CropWatch, there's some, uh, anyway, you can go in and register specialty crops or, or grapevines that you want to uh, alert uh, aerial applicators where your fields are. This could be something that could be also used that uh, many state departments of agriculture are already using. I just can't think of the name of it right now, uh, but where you can register your field so you could alert your neighbors. Uh, what, nice. What yeah, that could, that could probably be and, helpful. And you just touched on one thing, Greg, is, um, you know, there is discussion about hemp um, being considered a specialty crop under USDA. Is that still the, the thinking right now? So the, actually, uh, it's, we're handling the reg writing out of our specialty crops right. division right now. Uh, as far as, you know, for grants, the specialty crop block grant program, Congress was specific as to what crops uh, qualified under those. And I don't think that, hemp was, and in, hemp it. wasn't right. in that at that time. Right. So there yeah. are some opportunities to clarify that and have uh, Congress decide whether or not it's going to fit those classifications. And, and would, would you agree that because hemp is not a fruit or vegetable that it wouldn't, even if it is designated as a specialty crop, that it wouldn't interfere with farmers who are growing under the base crop program? Uh, yeah, I think the way that uh, FSA has handled it in the past since the farm program changed where your bases don't uh, change for, uh, uh, you know, uh, what Title I crops uh, you plant to the market. Uh, that we haven't uh, penalized farmers that uh, grew hemp under the demonstration, the research projects under the 14 Farm Bill. Nice. And, and one, another one of the options uh, that we've heard of that USDA is looking at, and it's, this is more coming from congressional members, um, is that because of the 30% oil content that comes out of the seed, that it could actually also be considered a, an oil seed. And certainly the secretary has special authorities under those things. So, you know, we. We are hearing from members of Congress. They're coming to um, to us, and soliciting information and support as to what the industry is doing and what's happening within other things. So, you know, this really is a snowball that is moving very quickly, with lots of support. So, if we do need legislative changes or fixes, that we have support both at in Congress uh, at the House and the Senate level to do so. 
Okay, so um, an audi two audience questions that are sort of related and relating to the to cross pollination. Um, one says, how does USDA handle the impact of in organic near conventional farming in relation to how we might be able to address feminized fields from fields producing pollen? And then the other question is, could requiring well, they say marijuana, but we'll say CBD in this access. Um, to be grown only indoors or greenhouses solve the problem with hemp cross-pollination. Um, I'm gonna say yes, that could help it, but that kind of, we don't want CBD to only be able to be cultivated indoors. You can't grow 15 acres under a greenhouse. That's, that's not entirely practical, um, and most farmers wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but I'll, Sorry, I just interjected you know, I, myself. I think there. some of these questions are uh, uh, are things that the hemp industry is going to have to discuss and come forward with recommendations and, uh, and in cooperation with uh, universities and uh, to help uh, help give us some guidance. I, you know, it's a new crop for USDA, just like it is a new crop for lots right. of. Uh, farmers and ranchers uh, across the United States. And so I think that we need to work together and listen to each other and, and figure some of this stuff out. Yeah, and I don't think there is another crop like this in, in history that, that has some of the same challenges. I, like, I would think traditionally staggering planting dates would be a solution for cross-pollination, but because cannabis is triggered by the light cycle, that doesn't really work in this scenario, so it is more challenging. Um, and one of the things, Greg, um, do you think that USDA would be creating a, a hemp advisory council as they have for other uh, crops and agriculture products moving forward? You know, the, that's a possibility if there was enough interest and there's enough issues out there, which sounds like there are, yeah. <laughs> to discuss that that would be helpful. It's also something that, again, the industry could work on together and then report out to USDA as well. There's several different ways. I, I was kind of looking to pass a lot of this work over to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, great. I don't have any more audience no, questions No, I did see some point. questions from the audience. So, okay. um, this you gentleman in the check shirt. All this is really, really helpful up to the past year or so. Might you just stand up so we could all hear your questions, sir? So uh, USDA uh, worked uh, with uh, uh, our, some other federal partners and uh, we set up the importation of the protocols for seed already. And we established how that would uh, go about. Uh, it needs to be you know, certified in uh, the nation where it's coming from as being eligible to be uh, hemp and then it uh, can come across the, the borders. Uh, uh, So, and the Farm Bill also established. So, uh, the Farm Bill does establish that interstate uh, transportation will be permitted, even in states that don't allow it to be grown. Uh, they will, uh, the Farm Bill says that it can be transported across them. There will be a method that that state uh, uh, maybe will go through to 
to make sure that they're comfortable with that, but uh, that is something that will happen. And, and, is it and fair to can, say you would still just need um, a certificate of, of um, analysis and a phytosanitary certificate to, to be on the, the safe side? So I, I think what, uh, you know, at the time that hemp is harvested, it will have been tested, uh, whatever the window is, 30 days, two weeks, whatever the regulations end up prior to harvest to have that tested. At that time, it is established as hemp, as far as USDA will be concerned. What happens to it afterwards, uh, not necessarily responsible for, but that certificate at harvest is... But for a, sowing seed, is that, is it, so that's just considered, is there a differentiation to USDA between sowing seed and grain? No, I don't think that as long as it's uh, qualified as hemp and tested as hemp at harvest, it uh, doesn't make us a difference. And, and if I might uh, further, um, if you did see just recently, uh, there was a legal opinion that came out of the General Counsel's Office of USDA. Um, Stephen Budden uh, really wanted to try to address some of the gray area between where we are today and where we will eventually be once uh, the regulations come out. I think it's one of the very first and rare times that USDA has issued a legal opinion on a crop. Uh, but it addressed uh, three principal issues. It addressed uh, banking, uh, but it didn't so directly. You have to learn the language of government to understand it. Uh, but it clearly gave a legal opinion that hemp has been removed from the Controlled Substances Act. To most regulators within Treasury and government, that means that it's no longer subject to banking um, restrictions and that the industry should be able to get fair and equal access, access to bank accounts and to people to process those uh, transactions. But there is the challenges of identifying that crop has been grown under a legal program. And so there's a couple hurdles there. Interstate transportation um, and commerce was also addressed. Um, and uh, quite frankly, I believe that it was written in such a way to help the truck drivers in Idaho um, and so we, I've taken that information, shared it with the Ada um, prosecutor. Uh, their response to me was, thank you, but we cannot comment on uh, litigation that is undergoing. <laughs> uh, but um, I think that you know, USDA, this is just another example of how much they want to support this. Um, and I, 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 don't, I hope you won't mind me sharing a private conversation. Uh, but Greg has uh, suggested that there is more interest in discussing hemp um, out of the farm bill than any other thing that's in it. So uh, there is lots of interest moving forward, and I think this is why the general counsel has done that. Um, and last but not least in that document, it clearly identifies uh, or defines hemp, both under the 2014 farm bill definition and the much expanded 2018 uh, farm bill definition, which includes you know, salts and isomers and, and extracts. Um, wait, I have another oh. question here. Um, I think this is for Axel. Is there an, an exact distance mandated by law that um, you're allowed to grow hemp from a specific distance from um, a marijuana growing facility? No, not at this time. Okay. No. I know in Pennsylvania they do have a three to five mile radius that you can't grow hemp within three to five miles of a Right. of a licensed medical marijuana facility. Um, and then the other question is, do you have a general sense of how many processors there are currently uh, domestically? I don't, I don't think anybody knows that. Some states require processors to have a license while others do not. And there is no central data collection point, which we're hoping USDA is going to be able to be that um, central data collection point to, to help pull the industry together with, with vital data such as that. There is a question right here. Um, so for years, I've heard that infrastructure is really the biggest obstacle to moving things forward. And Jeff, you touched on the lack of it a little bit. And it just seems to me, and I've heard this, that a little unfair that the farmers bear the brunt of all of the capital expenditure necessary to create this infrastructure just because they're at the beginning side of the uh, beginning part of the supply chain. And if we're talking about maintaining Is there a way for more um, governmental or public contribution so that we can level the playing field and advertise some of these costs? Who would like to go first? I'll take some of this. So um, 
I specifically went and joined the National Farmers Union Board uh, to represent Pennsylvania um, because I see on a regular basis the challenges that um, family farmers are having. Um, for the last five years, I volunteered to move this across the finish line, um, knowing that at the end of the day, once we did get across the finish line, we needed to find those solutions so that we could help those family farmers. Um, we do see it as an important uh, additional rotational crop, um, but we need to educate those farmers and we need to be able to provide them with some assistance. So the business model that um, I, for those of you that don't know, I now have joined Canopy uh, Growth. Um, I am implementing the vision of creating the hemp industrial parks. But one of the things that we realize